Okay, so today uh, we'll be looking at, uh, I think, chapter 19 of the book, which is all about uh, dates at uh, times, for, maybe for those people that will be following up uh, with the recording in YouTube. This is uh, the R4DS online learning community. So today, we'll, uh, Tim Newby will be taking us through chapter 19 of the book, which is about our uh, date and um, time. So over to you, Tim. I think you have to share your screen. So that... Let's make sure this works. Share. Right, can you see my screen now? Definitely? Yes, yes, just, you just have to expand the Zoom. Yeah, that's it, so. Is that yes, better? perfect. Yes, yeah, perfect. Lovely. Okay, so um, let's just see, make sure I can get between the different screens I want. Yeah, so most, basically probably be between there. Somewhere there should be the book as well, if I can find it. But, but anyway, we'll kick off with that. So it's just the introduction. So um, dates and times and the objectives are going to be how we can create date and time objects in R, um, looking at how we can create them from strings, from individual components, and also creating them from other dates and times. Um, we look at working with date time components, so how you can extract parts of a date time from a, the whole date time, how you can round them up or down, and how you can also just adjust individual parts of the date time. So, you know, change the day, the month, the week number um, separately from all the others. And then finally, we'll look at um, how we can do ar arithmetic on different time spans. So um, durations um, are a measure in seconds. And we'll look at how those relate to periods that we as humans use, like weeks and months and years. Um, and also using intervals to represent time spans with exact start and date times. So we'll be looking at a range of things throughout all of that. And I thought the easiest way to do it is probably going to be to just run it in R. So we'll, we'll start off by looking um, at how we can create them from strings, individual components, and existing objects. Okay, is that all okay? Yes. Good. So we've got, um, really, I think most everything we need is going to be in tidyverse. I think Lubridate is in tidyverse now. Um, uh, I think Lubridate is in tidyverse, but it's still under the development version from GitHub. That's oh, basically right. install it from GitHub. Is that, that is where. I'll put Lubridate in there as well, then, just to be on the safe side. And then I put string R in there because I might have used that for one or two of the exercises. I'm not sure. I think string R is still part of the tidyverse. Oh, that is okay. There we go. Yes. Oh, I've got it twice now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So we can quick quickly look at how you can create date times. And obviously, sort of the most immediate one is today. And there's obviously a command for that today. So if I just run that line, you can see we've got today's date. And then, so that's a date. And if we look at now, that actually includes a time as well. So where I am, we're in British summer time. It's just gone five past five. And the Which is the same time it. over here in Nigeria. That's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was a surprise to me, actually. I was surprised <laughs> to learn. <laughs> um, so obviously we can create date times like that. We can also um, create date times when we import data. So quite often data will include a date time field. So you can use readr, which will read in CSVs, and that recognizes ISO 18601 dates. Um, and ISO 18601 obviously is you have the year, you have the month, you have the day. So if we look at this, um, I think I've created that wrong, haven't I? I want to get rid of, oh no, so this is, you created one CSV with two columns, date and date time. Um, the date's the same, obviously, in both instances. So if we just create a CSV like that, you can see we've created it. And now we can use the read CSV command to read that. And there, if you look at the bottom, you can see we've got the two columns, first of all, as a date, 
So read CSB has automate, automatically recognized that as being a date. And then it's also automatically recognized in the second column, we've got a date time. So um, that works fine. Um, I got a little bit confused actually about what the need was for the carriage return in here, but I guess it's as a CSB, you need a different row. So between the, the, the row, columns, you have a comma, and between the rows, you have a carriage return. Um, is that right, all your family? I can, can you repeat it all again? Yes, yeah, so if, I, if I generate this, you see we need a carriage return. Yes, in, yes, yeah. Um, yes. And I'm guessing that's so it's recognized as a, the next row in the yes, CSB yes. when it's read. Yes, 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 correct, yeah, correct. Yeah, oh, good, good. Um, and if, if we haven't got an um, uh, ISO 18601 date, we can still read that in, but we actually have to specify um, what the different columns are. So you can read a CSV, so we're using the same file name, and then we can just say the column types, and we've got columns date is a date. And it's doing pretty much the same thing in each of these. But if you look, we're actually saying using this specification to change the order of some of the parameters. So the CSV stays the same, so, but then it reads it there as the um, 2015 January, the 2nd of January, I think that is, sorry, the 1st of February, it's read that in this. And then if we, but basically just by using the same file, you can see it's actually reading in the date slightly differently every time because obviously with that date um you know each of these columns we know that can't be a month so that that could be a day or a year and we can actually tell r what to treat it as so we get a slightly different format for the date each time by specifying it in that call date command um Okay. It also, there's some it, in non-English um, dates. Obviously, you need to provide a locale or a languages. So you know you can actually have um, a list of all the different languages that R will recognise. The default here, where I am, is English, um, but I actually live in Wales, which is called Cymru. C Y. Took me a little while to find that, but. Um, if I run that now, you can see I've actually changed the date format to set, have different days now. So these are the Welsh names for the days, Dith Seal, Dith Lean, and the, the Welsh month names as well. And everything else is exactly the same. And I'll put that back to English so I don't confuse myself. So we can change the language, the locale. Also, you can change the time zone within there as well. Um, and there's some other things that you can also alter um, depending on where you are and the format your dates are going to be in. Um, and if you're looking for one in a particular area, I found this quite helpful when I was trying to find stuff. You can actually just get lists based on continent. Um, so you can use grep or string subset. And again, just putting in continents, you can actually limit the choices there. So you can do all of that. Um, next, we're going to look at how to do dates from strings. And obviously, you can use year, month, day, YMD, which I think is part of Lubridate. Um, and there you go. So we just read that in saying that's the year, that's the month, that's the day. And we can do that in any order, pretty much. So you can do it month, day, year. So using Lubridate, you can actually read things in like that. Um, creating date times from strings. So those are all dates, but Lubridate will also recognize hours, minutes, and seconds. So you've got YMD, HMS, um, or you could do month, day, year, and just hours and minutes will work fine as well. And the other thing you can do, you can actually force something to be a date time by putting a time zone in as well. So here we haven't got a time at all. We've just got the date but we're just using the time zone um, argument of the YMD command to say we want it as a time in UTC. Um, and if we look at that now, it's actually is a time in there. 
um, though it hasn't actually got a time associated with it yet. Okay, so that's basically creating stuff from strings. Is, is that all okay so far? It's okay, there is no question yep. on this. Yeah, yep. good, good. Um, so we can also create date times from individual components. So in flights, which um, we've loaded the package, NYC flights, obviously it's got the time of all the flights. So if we just select the time components from that, we can select year, month, day, hour, and minute. Um, and if we look, they're a mixture of integers and doubles. So, you know, just numbers basically. Um, but we could actually select that um, with that. And also then if we use mutate with make date time, we can actually convert those integers and doubles into a date time. And we're making the date time from the year, the month, the day, the hour, and the minutes. So if we run that, we get something very similar, but this time we've now created this departure column, which is a date time made up of each of those individual columns um, before. So that's a way to make date times. You could create a function to do that if you want to do lots of it. So here we've just created the make date time function, which is just doing exactly what we did before, um, but now it's as a function. So if we want to read in all of these different times, departure time, arrival time, scheduled departure time, scheduled arrival time, rather than having to do it every time with the full command, we can now just say make date time 100, the name of the function we created with the components of the date time and running that will pretty much do exactly the same thing. So there we go. If we look at flights DT, up. yeah, we've got flights DT up there. And if we look at that, you can now see that in each of these, they are now what's called a POSIX CT, um, each of those times, which is what um, base R uses as the format for date times. Um, we can then plot that. Um, so if we look at that, it's working in seconds, if you notice. So um, we've had, if we plot this, shh, there you go. That's actually plotting the departure time as a frequency polygon um, with a bin width of 86,400, which is actually a day. It just happens to be that many seconds. Um, and then also doing it this way, we're again going to plot departure time. Um, let's try and look at that. So that is looking for um, departure times, year, month, day of less than the first of the second. So it's just second of the first. So it's on the one day and we're looking at the departure times across one day and this time we're using a bin width of 600 because the 600 seconds is 10 minutes so we've now plotted the time in 10 minute intervals throughout a single day so that's just using strings um, to actually enter dates and times you can actually convert so if we do today and then we can create that as a date time object as well. So um, as what we've done is it's another way of converting it from a date to a date time, basically. Or we can take now, which run on the own is a date time, but we can tell it we only want it to be a date. So as date now, it's no longer a date time. It's just a date object. So we can switch between those two in various ways. So I think that was the, the first bit. Is that all okay? Have I missed anything, Oliofemi? Yes, I think you are talking about date, how to switch between the dates, date time. I think you are correct. Yeah, good. So I think, um, let's just, actually, if I quickly 
run back and see where we are in the oops, in the thing. So we've done dates and date times from there. Um, yep, so we move on after that to work with the individual date time components. Um, do you want a quick look at the exercises? Uh, I've not practiced the exercise, uh, but if you can go through over them, there is no problem. Yeah, I, I kind of did just um, for my own purposes. So um, well, I think I've managed to get through most of them. So the first question was, what happens if you pass a string with invalid dates? So here we're trying to pass a string of two dates, the second one being bananas. And there you go. What we've got is an NA for the second. The first one's passed fine. The second one is just not available. You know, it's just not a date. And you get a warning message saying it's failed to pass. Um, and I think we were just looking, weren't we, at what this does. So today is today. And then we can, if we add a time zone argument to it, that obviously is going to convert today as a date time. If we look at today now, that's the 27th of the 3rd in Europe and London. Whereas if we set it to Australia and Sydney, I'm hoping the date's changed already now. If we run that, yeah, that's gone over to the 28th of the 3rd. So even though we put in the same time, today is reading the system time in my computer. Yes. If we use different time zones, again, if I run that again, and you look down here at the date, We've gone from the 27th of the 3rd, but it's already so, tomorrow. Yes. We there. So the time zone is actually affecting how the time is output. Um, and then there's a question here, just looking at trying to pass different date times in different formats. So I've done it three ways because I wasn't, it was asking for a read our column specification and a lubridate function. So I think that is the lubridate function, which is yes. really easy. And then the pass date and read CSV. So I converted it to a CSV and used read CSV. And I think I've also used pass date because I wasn't quite sure which it was asking. So if I run all of those, though, you can see um, DA and DB, we're getting the same answer. And then with read CSV, the output is actually a data frame, so DC is a single object, but it's the same date. Let me just run through that. And this basically is passing dates in different formats. So I think I can whiz over those really, there's no need to do all of those. The time ones were a bit weird actually, I didn't really get on with them. So I used um, strip time from the string and formatted it in hours and minutes. Um, so if we look at TA, where's TA gone? Should be there somewhere. Come right again. That did run, didn't it? I don't know where that's Is there, gone. is there, be, no, calm down, just calm down. TA is after TA. Oh, well, that's it. I've got to, yeah. There you go. So, um, yeah, basically, because it, but it, it wants to make a date time. So I, I wasn't able to get it to just create the time. I don't think a time element exists on its own. It's got to be a period. Is that right? I so in R, it's... there isn't such a thing as just a time without an associated it's... date. It's still a time, it's still a time. The BST, I think, is still a time. Yeah, that's it. So you've got the date, the time, but it's just chucked a, the date in as well. And then did a similar thing. I think that's the same idea, but in a different format. And in that case, because there is no date with it, it's actually um, TB. Yeah, it's it's put a it's put a date on that as well. So it's created a date time object in both cases. So that were them. So if we go on looking now at um, how we get different components, 
from a date time, if we create this date time here, um, you can see we've got um, date time object called date time read in, and we can get the year from that with year of date time, which is 2026, the month, seven, the day of the month, the year day, so that, that is, presumably that's just the, the day of the year from one to 365 or 366. Yes. So we've got 189 for the 8th of July, that looks about right. And then the weekday, so that's the fourth day of the week. And I can't remember when they start, is it from Sunday it counts, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, if we put month date time label equals true, it actually make, creates a factor with levels, the month name, and we can abbreviate it with false. So in that case, the default is it doesn't abbreviate, it abbreviates the month no. names. And then if we set abbreviate to false, you see we get the, the days actually in full. So actually, if I put label equals true here, we can find out Hopefully that'll tell us what, so we knew, no, it was day four. And just see if that will tell us what day it, no, it doesn't like it. Is there something wrong? The label, I think you are putting within quotes. Oh, it doesn't work. Yeah. Let's try that again. There you go. So it looks like the fourth day of the week is Sunday. Yeah, it starts at Sunday and day four is Monday. Um, so that's how that was working. Let's see if I can find the book for a minute, just to. So. Did you proponents? I think we did those exercises, didn't we? Then we went down to date time components, spoken about that. That's it, and we can use weekday to see that more flights during the depart during the week than on the weekend. So actually by just going to the, the date, the flights DT data set we had, we can just extract the weekday from that using mutate and weekday of what the departure time was, and then just plot that date if we go back in here. So you take for weekday and plot the day of the week as a bar chart. There you go. You can see that there's more flights during the week than there are at weekends. Um, it could also look at um, minutes. So we could do exactly the same thing, but just extract the minute column. So we've got minutes of departure time, group it by minutes, get the average delay and the number of flights by minute of the day, and then just plot that as a line chart. So you can see we've got all the flights throughout um, all of the days, but we've just looked at the minutes of the hour they each took off at, and we can see, sorry, the average delay or the departure, scheduled departure time, and we can see that those flights between around about 25 minutes and 55 minutes, um, of each hour have the shortest delays and they're, they're actually longer just before that. Okay, and we can do a similar thing. So that was for the departure time. So that's the time it actually left. And if we plot the same thing, but use the scheduled departure time, you don't see such a strong preference at all. So we kind of know that in terms of the way the flights were scheduled, there wasn't a particularly strong pattern about the time of day, but something's going on, which means at certain times of day, we seem to get backlogs building up, which then sort of go down again. And that's probably something to do with the fact that as humans, 
we kind of like round numbers and multiples of five. So if we look at the minutes um, of the scheduled departure time, and then plot the scheduled departure time hour by hour. Oops, I've done something wrong there. I might have to just go back up to the book. And where's the book gone? So that's what we're looking at. We did that. We did that. Well, that's, yeah, so I was trying to reproduce that plot, wasn't I? Which I'm sure worked the other day. Let's see if we can get it back again. Um, Schedule maybe to you can maybe you can run flight DT. Let's be sure that it's there. Can you highlight it and run it? Only flight, no, not that. Flight Which underscore DT. Let's confirm the object. This, hang on, so highlight this one. Line 248. Yes, we have flight underscore DT. Can you highlight only that line, only that variable and run? Flight. Oh, here. Yep. No, no, not that, not that. Line 240, yes. I like to only that one, that object, not that one. This one? That's, yes, only that one. Let's confirm what is there. Yep, okay. So that. Okay. Can you highlight it to up to the mutates? So let's move step by step. Yeah, step by step. I like it, thing. yes. Yes, let's confirm. Okay, that works. Can we highlight it up to the ggplot function? Okay. Okay, it doesn't like that. You have supplied table df objects. Oh, we'll see. Flight dt and then mutate minute because of minutes, uh, schedule departure time, and then ggplot. So we've got. Okay. Oh, I, I don't. Have, I, I don't we, need we that. Have, yes, we don't have. We don't need that because we do I, not I have. Put it, I put it in a pipe. We don't I? have scheduled departure there. Okay, that's. Let's try that. Yeah. So that's okay. Yes. So just plotting that as a fruit poly now. Yes. It's working now. So you can now check schedule departure, which will show the, 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 uh, the visualization. It's, it's not run, has it? Is that run? No, it's there. You need to call the, you are assigning it to an object. So you need to call the, the object. You need to highlight the object. Schedule uh, on that, yes. Okay, well, if I just delete that and just run it. Yes, if you delete that and run it, it will show uh, the visualization. Yeah, yes, perfect. Yeah. Lovely. So that works eventually. <laughs> um, so yeah, you can see how sort of flights leave at different times of the day. Um, and if we look at, so that's the scheduled departure times. And then if we do the same thing with the actual departure times, There you go. So they're quite different. So that's kind of what everybody planned to happen. And that's what ends up happening. And they're not quite the same thing. So it's quite often the thing with plans, isn't it? They don't go the way you expect. Somehow they just all yeah. leave. Yes, yes, that's... yes. Um, okay. So rather than just plotting individual components, you can actually round um, dates to a nearby unit of time using floor date, round date, or ceiling date, um, which basically rounds it up or down to whatever component you're looking at. And that does pretty much the same thing. So if we take flights DT, create the date time again. Uh, let's see what we've got in flights DT now. So that is literally just the date time now, isn't it, in there? Okay. I don't know why I did that. I probably didn't want to. <laughs> but so this takes the whole of, this runs everything. 
So we're filtering just for everything apart from the departure time and the arrival time. Oh, no, I'm removing, yeah, removing NAs in departure time and arrival time. And arrival time, and yes. Using that make time, make date time 100 to convert the, each of the departure time, the arrival time, and the scheduled departure and arrival times into date oh. times. Yes. And then selecting a bunch of columns. So that's just basically rebuilding flights DT, because I think at one point I lost it. Um, so we just, and that now we're going to use flights DT and actually get a count of weeks. And we're taking the floor date of departure time. And that's so we're just plotting by week the number of flights. So you can see throughout the course of an entire year from January 20 to 13 to 14, it's just extracted um, but for each week, the number of flights. So you can kind of see how they just sort of vary throughout a year. Oops. And then, oh, then, <laughs> this when I was trying to um, work it out, I tried doing it the other way that we saw before, grouping it by using the mutate to take the week time and then grouping it by weeks and summarizing by n. And I ended up with a um, slightly different answer, which basically is because I think the, the week just started from the first day in the data set, but with the floor weeks, it always goes to the start of each week. So you get slightly different answers if you extract the weeks that way to doing it that way. And I think just to convince myself that's what was happening. Oh, I've, I've lost I've lost a column now that I had earlier, I think. Oh, no, there you go. So you can see week one started on the 30th of the 12th and went all the way through to the 6th of um, January. But if you look, they don't quite line up from one to one. So you've got to be a bit careful how you subset the weeks, basically. You don't get the same answer. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, yeah, it's clear. I, know, I, know, I can understand it in my head. I'm just not sure I'm explaining it properly. <laughs> yeah, as long as that's clear. Um, okay, so here's to doing a similar thing using rounding, show the distribution of flights across the course of the day by looking at the difference between the departure time and the start of that day. we run that. So now you can see we're looking at departure hours throughout a day. But, um, I think it's plotted in seconds. So um, we've used a bin width of 1800 seconds, which I'm guessing is what's that half an hour. Um, and then and I think this is doing the same thing, apart from We've actually now converted the time in seconds from a day. We've actually turned it into um, hours, minutes, and seconds for departure hour. So if you look at the scale here, we can actually see the time as a time rather than as a number of seconds since the start of the day. And again, that's in half hour um, intervals. Okay, does that all make sense so far? Sure, yeah. So we've gone through rounding, produced those charts. Um, and then, yeah, we're looking at modifying components next. Um, so in the same way, we could extract different parts of a day. We can, um, where's that gone? We can also um, change each of those individual parts of a day. So here, we just create a date time. So we can see, see that there. 
And then if we just say year date time is 2030, so it'll go from 2026 to 2030. So there you go, as I run that. So I've just changed, you can change each component of that date time, that changes the month to one. So you can see we've now gone from month seven to month one. And you can change the hour using hour. So it's gone from 12 to one as being the hour. Oh, it's that, sorry, it's added one hour on to the previous one. So it's gone from 12.34 to 13.34. So we can actually change each of those individually without having to change the whole date time. Um, whereas update does a similar thing, but now it actually creates a new variable, which if you want to, you can call it the same as the old variable. So it just changes the whole thing. And then you can change all of those individual components at once. So rather than having to do it year, month, hour, um, I've actually changed all of them using a single command. And there's some other sort of interesting things in that if your values are too big, they actually roll over. So if we say we want to change the date from being the 1st of February 2023, and we want to change the day of the month to 30, well, February doesn't have 30 days. But if we run that, you can kind of see we've gone to the 2nd of March. So the end of February is 28. And then it's taken those two days onto the next month to give us the 2nd of March. Um, and in the same way, there aren't, there's more than 24 hours in a day. So if, if we try adding 400 hours on to, to um, so, sorry, trying to update the, the hours of the day on the 1st of February to 400, What's it, what it has done is it said, right, 400 hours is 17 days and 1,600 hours. So it's four o'clock in the afternoon on the 17th, if you add 400 hours on to the 1st of February. Does that all make sense? Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, good. Um, and then, oh yeah, I tried some more <laughs> exercises. So how does the distribution of flight times within a day change over the course of the year. Um, so what have we done here? We've got the departure hour and we've just taken the departure hour of each day and then group by hour and also done the same thing with month column, grouping it by month, then grouped the departure hour by departure hour and departure month to create the number of flights in each month for hour, then plotted that with a facet wrap on month. So that shows the number of flights for each hour, each hour of the day, with each plot being a different month. So you can kind of see at different times of the year, the shape of this is broadly the same, but in some months you get larger peaks at certain times of the day. Um, we're down here. So comparing departure time, schedule, departure time, and delay. So it's look at basically you'd expect the departure delay to be the difference between the scheduled departure time and the departure time. And it's just asked us to look at that. No, oh, I haven't done a plot on this one. Um I don't know why I didn't plot it. Obviously, I haven't finished that one. <laughs> if you look, though, you can kind of see there are some where you've got, a, it's gone over a day, really, is the obvious thing there. So if we've got a huge amount of seconds. So it's obviously arrived the day after it was meant to. So we've got a massive delay. Um, what's this do? I don't know what I've done with these. <laughs> okay, I've recreated flights DT. I 
and then I'm plotting, right, the difference between airtime. Oh, I remember this now. So it's taken flight DT, it's calculated the departure time, um, but selected departure time, arrival time, air time, where it's come from, where it went to, how far it traveled. And then it's looked at calculating the air time by the arrival time minus the departure time. And then I've plotted the air time against the calculated air time. Um, and I, I was just trying to see what was going on really. And I think looking at it again, we've got this thing where we've got a big negative, which actually is where it's a different day. So I think I've put in a case when to actually add a day. So you've got the 60 um, times, yeah, 60 times 24 is converting it into a day, I think. I'm trying to. So we get rid of the large negative by actually saying that when the calculated air time is less than zero, so basically it landed before it took off, um, we've added a day onto it. So we've got rid of that large negative that way, but there was still something a bit odd. Uh, so then I looked at using tap correcting for time zone. Because obviously when they fly, some of them are going to take off in one time zone and land in another. So I think here I joined it onto airports. So if you look at airports, just so you know where it's coming from. The airports um, table has the FAA code for the airport, but also tells you what time zone it's in. So I've joined the airports by origin, which is what in Flights DT, if we just look at Flights DT, origin is actually the FAA code that's used in airports. So I've joined it onto the, the airports onto Flight DT by origin, so that gets the place of departure, it's where it came from. So I've actually got departure time and I've selected TZ origin as being the time zone for departure. So if I run that, um, you can now see basic data in flights DT, but also now I've got time zone from where it took off. I've then left joined airports on again, but onto the destination to get the destination time zone. So if I run it up to there, um, you can see some of these flights now actually take off in a time zone of minus five hours, and then are landing in a time zone of minus six hours. So obviously the calculation needs to take account of that. Um, now, I'm not quite, this was just playing around with it, to be honest. It was just trying to see if it made a difference. So I'm not quite sure how they're displayed in the data set, whether they've already been corrected or not. So, I, so basically, but when I ran it correcting for that, I think it's just taking a while to think about it. You kind of get quite an interesting pattern. Um, and some of them still seem to take off before they arrive. So can I comment on yep, something? Please, please. Yeah. Okay, but can you go down a little bit to line four, a visualization 422? Just go down a little bit. So I, I think I don't yes. think I've this, I haven't run this bit of block of code here yet. Okay. So so what I did here was that um because you can see I'm still getting lots of negative um not negative, sorry. There's some... Okay, I think it's line 410. Okay, I think you, uh, There you say shape is equal to destination. Yeah. So, like, I want to, like, ask the destination, how many categorical variables do we have there for each destination? How many categorical variables? Yes. So in the color, what, in the color, you mean? Yes, no, shape is equal to destination. Yeah, so shape, there's, a, there's only six that seem to have a, a, 
Okay, because the default for ggplot2 is always six. So, but once oh, okay, the shape, so I lost all the shapes, that's what's yes. happening. So once the shape goes above six, so you need to supply your own manual shape. Ah. Uh -huh. Because the other data points, you will not see anything there. So once we so go it's just above, lost them. So if I rerun that without that now. So I've taken the shapes out. Yes. So I've got a much bigger data set now, yeah. Yes. Why is it put color against? Oh, okay. <laughs> color is still destination. But we've got, so you, you, can't, you can kind of see all of the different colors. I think I deleted the wrong bit. Maybe you, yes, okay. you can also That's remove good. the color, I think. Uh, the shape equals destination. If I take that out. And also the color, can you remove? Well, the color should just be saying is the airtime less than the calculator. Okay, airtime. okay, better, better, better. Right, so yeah, I did that. Perfect. Perfect. Still with some plates, you're yes. getting plate, planes with a negative, a calculated, an airtime less than the calculated airtime. So they've, these yes. ones landed before they took off. So it's going to be like true or false, true or That's false. It. Yeah. So so the next thing I did was. Um, but alternatively, we can use mutates. Then within mutate, we use if else to specify those condition or case when. That's when uh, the arrival time is less than this. OK, let it when it is true, it should be this. Then otherwise, when it is false, it should be this. We can also do that within if else. So we just create a single column, then we use that column for color. Oh, so, so yeah, create a column rather than using true yeah. or false. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. Yes, yeah, so you've got a flag to see it. So it does pretty much the same thing. It's just a different way of doing it. Is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, cool. I was just trying to see what I did. Basically, again, I was just playing around with this really at this point. See what. I think that's just the same. Oops, let's take those colors out again. I've got myself confused now. Well, I don't know what I was trying to do. Is that what I ran? Oh, I put color to destination for some reason. Yes. So let's get rid of that. I don't know why I did that. Oh, okay, that, yeah, so this plot, I was just looking at how far they'd flown and what is the difference between the time that I'd calculated the air time to be. Um, and how far they flew. So that's the, the difference between the calculated airtime and the airtime in the data set. I just call that the airtime error. And this is the distance they flew. I can remember that's Anchorage in Alaska, but you can basically see the further the planes fly. There's, there's something going on basically where there's a, a difference between calculated times and the reported airtimes. Um, so maybe it's to do with check in and check out or something, but I couldn't work out what that was. How does the average delay change over the course of, how are we doing for time anyway? I think, oh, quite a few minutes. So this is again, just taking the hour of departure time, um, calculating the mean of the departure delay, and then looking at how delay varies across the course of a day. So I've just done that by grouping on hour, and you can see the delay generally increases throughout the day. Um, the next one, I've done exactly the same thing. What day should you leave if you want to minimize the chance of a delay? So again, I've created um, a day of week um, 
which is basically just extracted the weekday from scheduled departure time. I've grouped by the day of the week and then calculated the mean departure delay for each week and also the mean arrival delay. And then I've, I've actually just plotted the departure delay against the day of the week, which I, I think is pretty much what we did before. Um, so if you look, sort of Thursdays are obviously the worst day. And if you want to minimize the chance, Saturday, you've got the least delays. And that last one, I just couldn't um, make much sense of it at all, really. So unless you want to say something on it, on the number seven, I'll skip that one, Olio Femi. Okay, for number seven, I think you confirmed you are having flight DT, okay? Then you now said mutated. So you want to create a new column that you call delayed. So, but that delayed, we are using case when. So yeah. we are using case when, and there we specify when the departure delay is greater than zero. So you want to code that variable as one. So all those variables where we have departure delay greater than zero, so we, uh, the condition there, where those condition is true, we want to code it as one. Yeah. But where we have the departure delay that is less than or equals to zero. So we want to code that variable as zero. So once we run that, we are going to have in a, our new column called delay, we are going to have variable bit ranging between one and zero. So those are the two value in which uh, we can find in that column. Then we also have minimum departure where we call so minutes of all the departure time. So it's going to make sure that all the departure time, we are going to extract all the minutes. Then we also have, we now group by the minimum departure time and also delay. Then once we group it by that, then we in line four, six, five, you are doing summarize. So in the summarize, you said the main delay, which is equals to what? The main of what? Departure delay. Then we now do the count, which is going to count all the observation based on the, our grouping. So it's going to do all those counting. Then we now pass that uh, to ggplot to visualize it. So in the X axis, we map the main departure. In the Y axis is the main delay. Then we now fill it by the delay. Remember the delay, we are going to have value of one and zero. So we now pass it to John Call, which is going to be a bar plot. But can you run it? Let's confirm uh, the visualization. I'm oh, sorry, with up to there? No, up to the John Call, yes. Oh, I, uh... so, I think something is wrong here. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you run it up to up to line four six three? Let's see what we have. Yes, up to there. Yes. Okay. It's taking the minutes. Okay, so. the delay is correct. The delay, okay. I see, I see. The delay is rated as double. So we need to convert it to factor. So what we will do there, go to line 466. Yep. Come to where we have fill is equals to. Put factor there, no, type factor. Open brackets. Then close it also. Did just put the close. No, I still, I need one no close, I... close again with one. Yes. Go. So run it. Yes, this is what I wanted to see. All oh, right, okay, gotcha. So for you to remove that factor delayed, so just add a plus sign. Uh, in front of line four six seven. Can you add a plus sign in there. front of line? Yes, no, in front, in front. After the opening and close, yes, put a plus sign, add a new layer. No, oh, come right. down. 
Yeah, uh, right. Oh, and, yeah, sorry. Yes, plus LAPS, L A B S. Open brackets. There you now say feel is equals to within string quotes, within quotes, is equals to within quotes. Then you type your delayed, D E L A Y E D. Then you run it so that okay. this will now remove the factor that we are seeing there. Yeah. Oh, that's neater, isn't it? Yeah. Right, so we've got the plot. I don't know if it confirms the hypothesis at all or not, but it doesn't seem to help as far as I can see. So these in red are scheduled flights which left early. Yes, yes. So those in blue, I think those are the flights uh, that we are delayed. We have more delay. Yeah. So we have more flights that we are delayed. Yeah. Okay, I think well, should we, we go on quickly delayed. just to finish off? Yes, so that because so we are behind schedule, this is six, one minute to six, I think. Yeah. There's, there's not too much left actually, is yes. there? Yes, so. yes can quickly whiz through it. So we're looking at time spans. Right? Let's just run this through in the book, I think, just rather than playing with that. If I can get R to come back. Not R, the Safari, there we go. So we go to time spans. So, uh, so this is looking at arithmetic with dates. Um, and we have to work with durations, which are exact numbers of seconds periods which represent human units like weeks and months and then also at intervals which is the period between or the start and the end of a period of time um, and it's saying there you can use each of those in many cases but try and choose the simplest one so if you only care about how long something took like how long was a plane delayed for we can use a duration if you want to add a human time, so if we want to know how many weeks it was between two in, um, events, we'd have to use a period. And then if you want to look at how long a span is in human units, we would have to use an interval. So if we look at durations, um, they've created a day function here. Hadley's age is today minus um, the 14th of October 1979 and when you run that it gives you a time difference of 1,500, 15,869 days. Um, okay so a diff time object always works in, um, can work in seconds, minutes, hours, days or weeks um, and so you know, you're never quite sure what you're going to get so Lubridate gives an alternative which always uses seconds. So rather than just a time difference, we're actually using a duration. So if you get, take H age as duration, it gives it as seconds, and then in brackets it will round it up to the, the sort of the most convenient unit. So just over 43 years. Um, durations you can use. Um, with all sorts of different constructors. So you can have a duration in seconds, a duration in minutes of 10, so 10 minutes being 16 seconds. You can have um, duration in hours. But if you look in each case, if we've got 12 hours, it's actually returning the number of seconds and then saying that's 12 hours. But we can actually quote the duration in any units we want. So half a day, or sorry, no, Duration in days from naught to five. So that is actually generating naught seconds for a period of naught days. One day is 86,400 seconds and so on, all the way through to five days. And we can also do the same thing with weeks and years. But in each time, it's returning it in numbers of seconds, first of all. 
So um, it always records in time seconds and larger units are created by converting um, minutes, hours, days or weeks to seconds. Um, years use an average number of days because obviously not all years are 365 days. We have leap years, which would be 366 days. Um, and also it's, you just can't even do it with months because they just get silly you can have 31 days or 38 30 days or 28 days so um, there's a lot of variation so lubricate doesn't work with months but once you've got a duration you can um, do arithmetic with it so if you do look at two times a duration in years of one you end up with two years or you can add on days um, sorry weeks and hours to that and again so we're just doing arithmetic with durations and we're also able to do that arithmetic specifying durations in different units so here we've added up one day 12 weeks and 15 hours and R has just converted all of that or Lubridate has converted all of that to a single number in seconds um, you can add and subtract a duration from a day so tomorrow is today plus one day well, last year is today minus a duration in years of one year. Um, and then there's a little warning here that, you know, you might get a, an answer that you didn't really expect. So if you look at 1 a.m. in America or New York, um, th that's on the 8th of the 3rd. You, you can see that is 0100 hours EST, which looks fine. But you add a day to that. And you can see, sorry, you add a duration in days of one. And um, we've actually gone to, to the next day, the 9th of the 3rd, but it's gone to two, oh, 0200 hours EDT. See, the time zone's changed. Um, the clocks have gone forwards. Um, daylight saving time started. So we've not actually added on 24 hours by adding on a duration of one day to that day. Um, Lubridate realised that um, the, the time zone had changed, basically, so you might not get the answer you expected in certain times. So to get around that, Lubridate, can, you can actually specify a period. So um, periods are time spans, but they don't have a fixed length in seconds, so they work in the way you'd expect them. So if you add a period of one day onto the 8th of the 3rd, 0100 hours, you get the 9th of the 3rd, 0100 hours, because days kind of know what we mean when we say we want to add a day. We don't mean exactly 24 hours, we mean what is the next day. Um, you can convert them in different ways. So if we look at hours, we can create hours in just the same way. Here we've got 12 hours and 24 hours. Um, you can say days seven, we've created a period of seven days, or we can create a period of months one to six. So um, in each case, we've created a period of one month, of two months, of three months. And again, you can add and multiply them exactly the same way we did for durations and you can add them to dates. So if you take a leap year and add a duration in years of one, um, you actually get the 31st of 12th. So one, so a duration of one year gives you the day before because there happened to be 366 days in that year. So if you add a duration of one year, which is 365 days, you're actually getting a different day. But if you add a period of a year, oops, I didn't mean to press that. If you add a period of a year to exactly the same day and time, you're now getting a different answer. It's actually adding a calendar year on it. And that calendar year happened to have 366 days on. So we've actually got a slightly different answer when we use a duration or a period to do the calculation. And you can see here exactly the same thing with daylight savings time, which is what we saw previously.
Aha, and then this this business. <laughs> I was getting horribly confused about trying to correct for daylight savings time. If I'd got to the end of the chapter before I'd tried to do it, I would have known I could have used a period rather than a duration to accommodate this fact that some planes arrived before they left. So you could actually generate um, a flag for overnight flights. So if we look at these, that arrived, took off at half past 29 minutes past seven and it landed at 20 minutes past seven. But it was um, and it, on, on the same day as well. But hopefully I can work out what's going on here. It was, a, it was an overnight flight. And I think I need some help here because it doesn't look like an overnight flight. We've got a departure time of 01.01.2013. Oh no, that's the scheduled departure time. Oh, we can't see the arrival time. So I'm guessing, so the arrival time basically must have been the, um, the next day. Hang on. Can you sort of jump in here, Olio Femi? I think I've got myself confused. Which line is that? So basically, it's around here, it's saying that um, some planes appear to have arrived at their destination before they departed from New York City. Now, I can't see the quite what's going on here because I haven't got... Uh, the arrival, arrival time, time less than departure time. No, the arrival time is there. Can you copy that? Uh, Shay, you have the object flight DT already in your environment. Can you copy it and go back to our studio? Let's see. Come on, I know you're there. Uh, maybe you paste it somewhere. I probably got it. Oh, no, I didn't do that. Oh, sorry. Okay. You can open a new script. Yeah. Yeah, it's just pasted there. So what's in front of line two? Can you put a pipe there? Line two up. Yeah. So, so can you put it? Yes. Then you type view. View, yeah. Open and close parenthesis. Okay. So can we see it there? Okay, so it left at 29 minutes past seven. Yes. And it landed at 0300. So it's basically taken off before it it's landed before it took off, hasn't it? <laughs> which is which is what it was saying. I mean that that's that's exactly yes. what what the book was saying. I just I was getting confused because I couldn't actually see that in what was in the book. If that makes sense. Um, so basically, I think they ah, right. Okay, this makes sense now. Creating um, a flag for overnight flights so you can create a column called overnight so if the arrival times before the departure time um you add one day to those flights let's let's run this because that doesn't uh, DT now. So we've got the flag saying whether it's overnight or not. What's that? Overnight? Yeah. So and then it's adding days. Okay. So where it's overnight, it's adding a day to it. Is that right? Yes. 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 That's what's going on. Right. So if we look at this, 
So if we look at this now, yeah, we've So that is so overnight is false. 2013-01-01. Right, oh, so, okay, so it's added a day to the departure time where it's not an overnight flight. Is that what it's done? Yes, yes, it was gone ahead. Yeah, okay. So, so that's actually now saying that it took off. Let's have a look at this. The arrival time was half past eight and the departure time. was well, 20 past five, but it's the next day. Is that right? Yeah, so we've got 517 on the first of the first and then the second of the first 8.30. So it's, it's corrected that mistake for the overnight flights. Um, so that's all right. Okay, so I think this is the last bit now, isn't it? Looking at intervals, so what does a duration of years divided by, of one year divided by a duration of 365 days return. Okay. Um, and it's not quite one because a duration of one year is the average year, the way R works. And so that's 365.25 days. But if we work with a period, it depends what year you're in, because a period associated with 2015 would give you 365 days, but a period of one year in 2016 would be 366 days. But if Lubridate doesn't know what the year is, it can't know exactly how many days were in that year. So even though we're using a period, if we've not specified a date, it will still think it will use 365.25 days, which is exactly what we had for the duration. But if we specify an interval, we can specify a start and end date for that interval. Um, okay, so that's basically specified created two objects, Y 2023 and Y 2024 um, on the 1st of January. Um, and we've got a date time, which each of those values in. Um, and they look like pretty much exactly the same thing, but one year apart. But now if we divide Y20203, by one days, we can see that there are 365 days in that object. But in this object, we have 366 days. So by specifying an interval, rather than just a period, we can be specific as to which year it is. And Lubridate can actually correct for whether it was not a leap year. Phew. <laughs> OK, I'll skip the exercises here. And I think finally, it just looked at time zones. Um, and obviously, time zones get even more complicated. R uses an international standard for time zones, um, specifying continent and city um, for those time zones. And basically, the, the reason it uses a city is it's actually got to record decades worth of time zone rules and country names change, but city names don't always change quite so much. So by specifying a city rather than a country, that um, sorts that problem out. And also, if you look at different cities in America, say, OK, 
can use the same standard time, but we <laughs> say it's terrible, doesn't it? Michigan in Detroit didn't apply daylight saving, so it had to use a different name. There you go. So time zones are complicated, but you can actually find out what time zone R thinks it's in by using system time zone. And then I think we looked at Olsen names earlier, actually, which tells you all of the different time zones. Um, and in R, the time zone is part of the date time that only controls printing. So all of these things are exactly the same instant in time. Um, so if you've got x1 minus x2, they're different. They look like different times, but they're in different time zones. But if we subtract them, we get a time difference of zero. So as far as ours concerned, those are exactly the same number. Um, and Lubridate always use UTC. Um, you can change time zones by specifying time zones um either when you create them or you can use with tz um, to actually specify a time zone for an object um and then you can also what can you do here so x4 is basically x4a is the same time but in a different time zone so if we look at them, they appear different. Printing X4, we're getting 1200 hours there, but 0230 there. But if we do the arithmetic, subtract one from the other, they are exactly the same time. Um, and you can also change the underlying instant in time. So if an instant has been labeled with the incorrect time zone and you need to fix it, you can force the time zone. And in that case, it's actually changing the time, not just the time zone, which is the way the time is represented. So if we do exactly the same thing as above, but forcing the time zone rather than telling it to use a time zone, we find that now we've created a difference in time. Um, all right, that... <laughs> Thankfully, it's the end. Um, but yeah, we've looked at some of the tools that Lubridate actually uses. You can see date times can be much more compli complicated than you think at first glance. And I think I've ably demonstrated that this afternoon. Um, and there are different ways of dealing with dates and time, um, either as intervals, periods, durations, date time objects, which if you manage to sort of work it out carefully in your head, it will help you solve whatever problem you're trying to work on. I think that's all I've got for today, are you, Femi? Yeah, thank you very much uh, Tim, for, okay. prese <laughs> <laughs> for presenting the chapter. So I think next week we'll meet again. I'll try to see how we go over the, how to deal with missing uh, values in R. So I, I, I'm hoping that uh, all, mem all the members of the club will be joining us uh, next week so that we have a full half so that we can really uh, discuss on how we can deal with, uh, discuss about the chapter. So I will be seeing you the same time uh, next week. Uh, once again, uh, thank you for presenting the chapter today. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for your help. <laughs> <laughs> so see you next week. Okay, yeah, see you next week. Goodbye.